next speaker is going to be Chief Executive Strategic Engagements of Nutshell Group and former uh, Chief of Air Staff of the Pakistan Air Force, Air Chief Marshal Suhail Aman. Let me just say a few words about him before um, I invite him to the podium. Um, everybody knows of Sir Suhail Aman's um, dynamic and uh, very um, well-respected and very celebrated career in the Pakistan Air Force. He took a number of steps that um, I uh, dare say have not been taken before um, in the Air Force. Um, he is credited with the orchestration and actualization of uh, the Air Force's modernization plan. He's a true believer in education for all, and this is something that we see him doing to this date. He introduced various scholarship schemes for deserving children during his tenure as Chief of Air Staff. He established two medical colleges and three air university campuses across Pakistan. He has also pioneered initiatives for the welfare of persons with special needs. Air Chief Marshal Suhail Aman, retired, has several awards to his credit, which include Nishane Imtiaz Military, Hilal Imtiaz Military, Sitara Imtiaz Military, and Tamgha Imtiaz Military. Yes, you can clap. And he's also the recipient of the Legion of Merit of the Turkish Armed Forces, the King Abdulaziz Medal of Excellence by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the United States Legion of Merit. This is the highest military award of the US Armed Forces awarded to any foreign military official. This calls for a very, uh, very large round of applause, please. So sir, we're very grateful that you're joining this session and we're very honored that you're here. I would also like to add one more thing. He was the architect of the counter-terrorism um, operation, which was known as Zarbe Azb. And all of us are witness to the fact that Zarbe Azb brought lasting peace to the country. So with this, I would request Sir Suhail Aman to please come and share his thoughts on the topic. Uh, what a great pleasure. Uh, what Sufyan said, I truly believe from my heart, that's going to happen, inshallah, for sure. My, my effort would be, um, uh, I have a difficulty. End of a seminar, uh, all wisdom has been spoken, and for to speak anything wiser is so difficult. So what I'll do is that I'll try and marry it up with a few stories uh, about the leadership, about, uh, and more importantly, uh, whatever we have talked about in the last uh, two days, what is the track that we follow where Sufyan wanted this country to be? So that's the track that I would like to talk about, share, and let's go on. Um, but one more point. I think the very interesting speech which will wake you up really will be, of course, Musadek Bhai is a true orator and he is a known subject, uh, especially now when he's the government, he'll bring it another very good perspective. Uh, Personally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here as a very content and a satisfied man for one reason. Five years before when uh, we began with this uh, future summits and leader Islamabad conferences, I was in uniform, um, but I was so attracted with this concept. It all hats off to Nutshell, uh, Asfar, God bless his soul, uh, Javed Akhai Saab and now his son Ali, who envisioned this. And why I say I'm so happy and satisfied, I see the difference five years before and now. You are the people who are going to make this difference of Sufyan's 2040, 2047 Pakistan. We are the people who are going to do it. But then what happened about talking these buzzwords, um, slowly we saw the transformation, digitalization, new norm, COVID was a time for not layoffs, but for building relationship with your subordinates. And so many other things which were talked um, from these leaders. Everybody understood technology is a mean and technology is not a destination. The actual destination rests here in the minds of the leader. And I thought that during all these seminars, discussions, we're moving step by step, probably could have been faster but then we are moving in the right direction. And my theme point here is that in Pakistan, we are on track. And I'll prove that when we go on and we talk. We possibly need a complete uh, support from the government and public sector has potential which is absolutely immense. 
CEOs who are 35 to, I initially thought I'd say 40, but 35 to 50 here are absolutely relevant because even those who are 50, they should be what, 75. And 75 is a pretty good age to contribute. In fact, you contribute till the time the God calls you back. So I think we are important, you are important, and your own silos, you're going to build your organizations and let that cumulative and integrated effect take Pakistan to Sufyan's Pakistan. Um, I retired about four years ago and uh, following my noble father's uh, tradition. And remember, your children will not do what you tell them. They will do what you exhibit. And I saw him till his last day work for the betterment of Pakistan. I learned from that great man, and I'm trying my every second to be spent for Pakistan, whether it was in uniform or till the time I go away from this world. For the leaders who are here, predicting future is so difficult, so vague. We talked about geostrategic involvement, we talked about the policies, and we talked about the digital, digitalization, and so much. But then remember, something beautiful came up yesterday when there was a blind um, climber, and he was behind the man we talked about this yesterday. And when he was asked, you climbing the mountains thousands of feet high, are you not scared? And he said, each one of us is blind. You put your hand there, hoping that you'll grab the handle. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all about leadership. You will never see the whole staircase. Take the first step in faith. And when you take the first step in faith, you'll move on. And that's how your organization will read your spirit, your body language, and they'll follow you. So you may not see the whole staircase, take the first step in faith. You're incredibly uh, lucky to be the leaders. You make a dent in this universe, as a Steve Jobs possibly said. You make that difference in your organizations, in your governments, in your whatever sector that you are. And the best thing is you make a difference in the people's lives. Having spent about 40 years in the Air Force, I think all those moments where we made the difference in the people's lives are remembered. And they're very close to the heart. I remember, and uh, there goes the first story. Um, I remember one of our strategic aeroplanes, um, the air to air refuelers, were banned for an overall. And we couldn't get them overall from anywhere because of the political reasons. We could have gotten them from some country, but then everybody stopped. And one day we decided, you know, the handle in the dark, we'll do it ourselves. A lot of people thought that we're crazy. How can we do this? Because we do not have the inside of the aeroplane. Alhamdulillah, the project was done quite a bit. And I used to visit this aircraft, and one day I was coming out, one of our senior uh, JCO, he said, sir, my wife sends you the regards. And I said, thank you. But what is it like? He said, I have two special children, and the Air Force policies, and ladies and gentlemen, the leaders here, you'll find so much relevance when you talk of your own organizations. And he said, we had two special children who couldn't hear, and the policies that the Air Force adopted, both the children hear, and they're going to the normal school. <laughs> I, I hugged him and walked out, and now when I'm walking to the helicopter, what does the base commander tell me? So he's the man who's the architect of developing the entire overall. He comes here at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we push him out at 11 at night. And not only him, but that's the eco effect he created with the team and everybody. While a lot of you may be talking of economics, it was a $16.5 million overall, and the Air Force accomplished it in less than half a million dollars. This man. You look after your people. My God, you look after your people, and honestly, then you will start to realize this about, and I was happy that we're not putting that uh, foreign uh, currency into uh, somebody else's hand, but more important for me was this huge eco effect within the organization, and the organization changes. But then be a man who stands in front of his people in a time of crisis. And we did talk about it that in the morning as well. The leadership is like a teabag. 
The quality of it will only be known when put in the hot waters. So simple. NASA's 7576, a spaceship being sent, crashes into the sea, and the leader goes to the media and says, it's my fault, I'm responsible, I'll fix it. Two years down the line, same thing is done, successful. You know what does this guy do? He pushes the project manager to the media, and he says, he's the guy who does it, walks out of that place. That is what is leadership all about. When, you, the, when the going is tough, tough gets going. We just talked about it. Let me give you, uh, and that will be the last on the leadership, and then I'll move on to uh, the Pakistan thing. This is a story that a uh, uh, few of you might have heard, and I'm sorry for the repetition. But to my mind, this is all about leadership, this one story. And you have 12 attributes come in one by one, and you'll see those coming in. I'll try and point out if I miss them out. Get them structured in your mind. Uh, 20 years of terrorism, and you know, this country was subjected to huge crisis. Uh, one of our bases got hit. There was a big fight. And two of our very important war-winning machines received substantial damage. And I'm talking of uh, Saab AVEX aeroplane. AVEX are war-winning machines. You stand high, you look at what's happening on the other side, and you guide the entire battle. That's what it's all about. We looked at the aeroplane. We contacted the OEM, the Saab. They came in and spoke to us. I clearly remember $378 million bill. And uh, you, can't, uh, you can't fly this aeroplane, bend them because you cannot certify, the SAB would not certify. And I said, if you don't certify the aeroplanes, what use is that repair for? And I quickly changed this topic because I knew they're not going to do it. And I said, how's Lin Chopin? I remember flying the SAB uh, uh, ribbons there and we moved out. And my subordinate said, who is going to do it, sir? You let the OEM go. And I said, this. And I said, we'll do it. This was the leadership and the relationship out there within, and I think few of them sit here today as very silent uh, uh, heroes who did that. There's an intellectual team which began looking at the PhDs, how to repair the aircraft, Pakistanis, we're talking about the talent. Only one officer put to look at what the certification agency is, He's an Air Vice Marshal, retired now. And we said we need to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, only one year down the line, Pakistan became the fifth aviation certification agency of the world. That's where we are. One and a quarter year down, the first aeroplane was recovered. We talked about incentives, the leaders here. I went the day the aeroplane was supposed to be flying. They didn't, I didn't tell them, but I was there. And I said, how could you fly this aeroplane without me? Everybody with an aeroplane which was completely damaged with the wings and tail and everything gone, and everybody was jumping to the aeroplane, no, we'd fly this aircraft because we'd done it ourselves. That's where the success was. We went into the aeroplane, we flew the aircraft, we came back, it was all done. The man who was silently doing everything had reached his top rank limit, and I was keeping his ranks in my pocket. We flew, it was all done. I called him over, gave him the next rank, and it was all absolute jubilation there. Ladies and gentlemen, two things here. You innovate, you can do it yourself. You make a decision, Yes, you have to grope in the dark to make that decision, let it go. You need to give that environment to the people and that comfort, that incentive, that this can be done. I'm not an IT man, I'm not a technology, I'm not an engineer, but I have that faith that it can be done, it can be done. And what about the challenges or opportunities? So the challenge was huge. I mean, we lost 75% of our looking across capability, but this is all done. So from the challenges, you bring out that great opportunity. Look at the teamwork that you generated. We did talk about different forces working together. And of course, the technology put in use, everything being done. And I very clearly remember the figure, $25.5 million as compared to 387. 
That's the achievement in case you decide to do it yourself and your all organizations can do it all by themselves. But then it was not $287 million uh, saving. It was important that the organization change that day. We can do it ourselves. All right, if we can do this ourselves, why can't we make the most sophisticated weapons, the precision guided weapons? One year and our hands were not like this, on these special weapons, our hands were like this. We've now began exported those weapons. And you know what is the weapon cost? We're paying $50,000 for one weapon, which is just about four feet, but then of course it is as devastating in the night. It can go and pinpoint through a window. Instead of importing those, we began exporting those weapons. Look at how these small things, and I call them small because they ultimately rest in your mind and not in the total technology. Empower, I think these are all buzzwords that we were talking yesterday. You empower people, you can do it. And you guys will come up with strange things and they'll bring it out and they will make that happen. And even today morning at the coffee, one of those boys was telling, since you left last four years, we've gone to the missile technology, we've gone to this regime, we've gone to this regime, and this happens. And last but not the least, ladies and gentlemen, when all this was happening, the leadership in the Air Force thought, why not put all this together? Why not put the university and the industry together? We did talk about it yesterday. Now, under one roof, you put the university, you put the industry, marry them together, put a certification agency on top and a design center, and the birth of Aviation City happened exactly five years from now. We went through this in two years, got onto the Aviation City, and today, Aviation City, one of the gentlemen sitting here, Naeem Zimadar, I remember one of the seminars saying, Aviation City alone, in the next five years can produce $20 billion if done properly. That is how the small reflections can make hugely big difference. And I'm very grateful to God Almighty who made all this happen. Another institution came up besides the aviation city was the aviation research and they brought indigenization development center. And we changed the word IE from indigenization to innovation. And I think the previous panel did talk about it. My point here is to the leaders here. Don't think what will this do? What will the government do? What will it do? See what can you do. Get your organization to that level and all that bits and pieces will make that difference. And I'll tell you what Pakistan has done even in your realms. Technology we talked about. And digitalization is something, a huge buzzword. Now moving on slowly, to coming to the corporate world and talking about a few of their technologies. It's just a week ago, two of my daughters, one coming from Australia and one coming from UK, were sitting down and they both opened the accounts in Pakistan. And I was sitting aside, the conversation was, wow, I'm doing my internet banking and I can see the account number as well as the name of the person that I'm shifting money to. And I said, yeah, what's the big deal about it? Even at the age of 62, I believe that was so big about it. And she said, no, no, in Australia, you don't get the name. So if you print it a wrong digit, your money is gone. It's gone to a process. And the girl from the UK said, you don't get the account number when you transfer the money. Our digital track is right. It needs to expand, it more needs to integrate into a bigger system, and more importantly, we need to bring the financial uh, digitalization to practice to plug those gaps on corruption, to plug those gaps where the money can go anywhere else. So I think we're not done a bad job there at all. A quick 30 second on the geostrategic environment. Then I come down particularly to Pakistan. We talked about it a lot. Um, let me summarize to say the history has its cycles. 100 years before 1920s, Britain was a great power. With the Anglo-Afghan wars and all this happened, we all are aware. And then were the world wars and the Germans and the Americans and then the splintering of the great British Empire. And then we get to a place in 1991 
where there's a superpower after the Cold War era disintegrates, splinters away internally, more to say. And then the unipolar world, I think, I say it very clearly, that in the history, it will be remembered that the 30 years of unipolar world brought what to this earth? Massive destruction, talk of the Middle East, talk of the Arab Springs, uh, talk of other areas. But then I think that's where the unipolar world was. But then status will not stay the same. A lot of other power centers have come in, Russia, China, and of course China being a little behind the Americans. But that's the construct and least to say on this is, it's going to be turbulent. And why is that important to us? It's going to, to be turbulent. You will have to find your way through, navigate your way through, there's no giving up, there's no second option. But the world will be turbulent. And there will be challenges. The war in Ukraine, look at the fuel prices rocketing up. And of course, the nature playing its own tricks out there. So you will have to manage your organizations and you'll have to manage this Pakistan with a lot of adroitness, with a lot of strength, with a lot of skill to make sure that you reach where Sufyan wants us to reach. What's going to happen to food? 2030, 9 billion people. Earth does not have that kind of resource. So there is a food crisis, which is most likely in 2030. It's actually not too far away. Uh, future, ke mein, um, I remember Musadek Bhai making a statement few days back in a seminar, and he talked about what the future is likely to be, and he gave example of Star Trek in our days, that you know, he would put, put his hand there and the coffee would start to boil, and he would just point at the uh, TV screen and this guy would appear and they would come converse. All this happened. So whatever is going to happen about the future in the next 25 years is not a story. 2030, there's a food crisis just coming. So don't we need to gear up now? And that I will address when I come to Pakistan. And you know what is going to be the superpower on the globe, on the food? Russia, the Siberian prairie, that's where the food, uh, supplies and everything will eventually hold on to. On health, something very terrifying, and health is something uh, on which there's a lot of focus, a lot of research. Um, there are small um, uh, tags which will be attached, the chips attached to the body, which will monitor the body, and it's happening. The researchers are pretty much on, and they will understand the hypertension level and all those, and adequate uh, transmissions of medicines will carry on. So average lives you're talking of about 100 plus years. Now that's where the technology is going. But then nanosciences is something and the neurosciences is something which is something amazing which is coming up. There will be no keyboards and your mind with a small bit of surgery will get linked up to the computers. But then it's not about the computers. It's honestly not about the capacity also. It's about the processing and the decision making that your minds will get into augmentation. The HIV-8 virus, uh, the vaccine is very much on the cards, so those will all be eradicated. The quantum computing, uh, the clouds that we talk about, the Facebook and the Apple have already gone to cloud capitalization. So whatever your companies are pushing the data in, that would be floating out there. We talked about the cybersecurity. So anybody who pays will have an access. And when that access is granted, it is the amount that you pay that you get the speed and your access. Oil is another myth. Fossil oil is not going anywhere. At this time, we are about 80% of energy through the fossil. We talked of a lot of renewables, but only 1%. IEA it talks about 35% increase in the energy in the next 25 years. 24% of that will be again from the fossil fuel. That, and the capacity is only about 15%. So where are the alternate sources of energy that we're really going to tap in? And I'm making these points, ladies and gentlemen, for the next 25 years, this is going to happen. So would the small little tidbits uh, house solar system that we are doing, will they serve the purpose or will we have to look at something much more strategic? 
is that the food that we are talking about is pretty okay with 240 billion people going to 300 billion uh, by 2025? Now, these are the real challenges. And I want to say this with a big heart, these things are going to happen. These things are on the cards and they're going to happen. We better look at these very, very seriously to reach what the Sofyan has really said. Now, let me get to last uh, five minutes of my presentation, and that's about Pakistan 2047. And I divide it quickly into security, stability, and prosperity. You get these two right, and you get this right. If your country is secure, you get stable, and you bring prosperity to the people. Well, that's a very clear equation. There are no two ways about it. We stand at a very good place in terms of security. I think in 2018, after we have done away with all this terrorism business, this country lost 80,000 people, $120 billion. I mean, gosh, and something like 18,000 people who lost their limbs. This is not a number. Look at the magnitude. And we understand the pain. When there is terrorism going on in the country, nobody thinks of an education policy. Then you're firefighting. My request to the government is that this is a huge patch. Don't let it re-emerge at all. Because when that happens, your stability and prosperity have gone for a six. Therefore, get this window of opportunity of security. Don't miss it. And any researchers should come up with a heavy hand and, of course, with a lot of diplomacy. And I would not really talk of the force here. I'll talk of the smart policy. We put the dialogue and the hard power, if required, together. I think that's what the Joe and I finally said that needs to be done. So that's for the security. On the stability, if the engine doesn't work, and I'm talking of the political system and the government, the train can't run. It's so simple. And when you get the system right, democracy is the solution, perfect. But the democracy is not a one-fit-all solution for everybody. I've been to Ghana where you have a very different democracy model, but the country becomes prosperous and they're running fine. We need to have a political system fixed up so the engine starts running in the right direction and the governance becomes the top priority. And that will lead to the whole thing. You might think that I'll talk of economy next, but it's no. It's not economy, it's the population. 2.4% is insane. We need to put a full stop to it, and somehow we didn't talk about it in the last two days. We have to take war footing measures to control this, and I think from the religious point of view, we need to utilize those people like few of the other countries have done. If that being the fear, no, that's not. Islam is the most modern and most enterprising religion. We need to m bridge the gap and make them understand so that's the voice will be heard with the people. But we talked of exports, huge human, human resource that you have. You're talking of what, 60% people under 30, but then how do you train them? There's a large gap in the West, there's a large gap elsewhere. Couldn't we tra train good nurses, good dairy, good farmers? And I've just listed three, but then we were talking about it yesterday, that there's a large, large appetite in the West to absorb these people. I don't want my country to be known for the taxi drivers in the West. You need to bring this. And now the point is, how do you train them? And that's the responsibility of the corporate. And we were talking about it yesterday. Let's not blame the universities. Let's not blame government. Let's not blame anybody. It is the corporate responsibility to make sure that you participate what happens in Boston. The universities, they all have the corporate sit on their boards. They determine the curriculums. You need those people. You need to determine what kind of quality these people need to have so that you get it there. So when you get the, right, get the university graduates, you don't have to work for them for next three years and get them enabled. They better be coming out with the right education. Uh, a mindset has to change as a country. And this mindset is that I can get away with uh, four hours works and six hour works and eight hours works, no. The work is commensurate to productivity and what you do. 
And that mindset has to change right from the public sector to down everybody. In the private and the corporate, it is easier, but in the public sector, people have to be taken to task if they don't do this. And I see this pandemic coming up. This civic sense, we talked about civic sense is good, teaching at school, and that is fine. But uh, talk of uh, neither's land. Can you make a lawn which is not appropriate? Your neighbor will sue you. Can you put your garbage into the neighbor's lawn? Or even in your lawn in a wrong way, your neighbor will take you to the court. We need to have a legislation where we make sure that people get into the right kind of civic sense where Sofian wants us to be. Academia industry is something very, very pivotal. And I think like finance minister said yesterday, increase the export. So human resources are one that you export. But then till the time you don't put the academia industry together under one roof, even virtual. You saw the Aviation City example. You cannot add value. And if you can't add value, you can't add exports. But are we teaching the right things? Are we talking of the energy solutions, the food security, the nano and the neurosciences, bionic technology, AI, robotic, 3D printing? Are we studying everything? Are integrate it with the corporate world. That's the right way to do. Do privatize. There's no problem with that. But put the workers' stakes into that privatization, the Chinese model. That will work. The women empowerment is something which is absolutely talked about, it, about a lot. Our girls working in the rural areas uh, get paid one-tenth of what they actually, what the market price is. Why can't entrepreneurship and the connectivity and the digitalization of the finances bring them into the field? We had a very pleasant experience in the Air Force about the girls. Our girls fly the fighter jets, and I think they're no lesser. They put our entire um, logistic centers in place. They have that organizing ability. And I think if we miss out on that segment, we'll miss out a lot on the nation building. That's important. My last two points are build and strengthen institutions and not individuals. The day I left Air Force, I was very happy because the team behind me was fully capable of taking the charge and taking them forward. And last point and the story. Uh, is one of the Singapore bank which did beautiful progress and um, they were going to the board and their, their figures were going high three times the yesterday year, and they were very confident to get a pat on the back. And the board said, how have you done it? And of course they explained. I said, but hold on. You compromised on the minor shareholders' rights to bring profit to the bank. And they said, but we did this for our bank. I said, that's not our value system. The CEO, the deputy CEO, the CFO, three guys got fired in that meeting. You have to hold a value system to progress. So my message here is that any progress on numbers is not important if it is not backed by the value. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And let's greet 2047 Pakistan, inshallah. Thank you very much.